at this fish, so I'm gonna get this guy right back in the water. Yep, this is just a show about black sea bass. So go ahead, fast forward to the end of the trip to see if we fill the cooler, because after all, sea bassing is nothing more than an easy fill the freezer meat mission, right? You know that's exactly what you're thinking right now, and I can't blame you, as that's precisely how I used to feel. But hold on a minute. The black sea bass has a voracious appetite and is usually willing to eat almost anything you put in front of it. When you find them, the action comes fast, which makes them perfect for showing new anglers, especially kids, what this whole fishing thing is all about. On the line, they pull hard, especially if you scale down your tackle to scale up the fun. And the absolutely stunning color palette of a male black sea bass makes for unbelievable photos. These are just a few of the sea bass's qualities that tend to get overshadowed easily by the fact that the black sea bass offer some of the best tasting fillets in the Northeast, and maybe the planet. As Chris Megan and I make the short trip from Falmouth Harbor to Buzzards Bay, we're greeted by lit up screens synonymous with spring sea bassin. We'll share what makes the black sea bass one of the most unique species in our waters, and perhaps increase your appreciation of a fish that over time has become so damn special to me. Gee, so we got the chart going, and the beauty behind the Simrad, and I know you're very familiar with it, NSO Evo 3, 24 inch screen, I literally can do everything I want. I really think we should get all these fish, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that looks really good right now. What we set out to do is, is first establish our drift. Um, that's a little bit of a, an upwelling or a plateau that we're gonna drift over. Um, but these marks look really good and we're away from the fleet. We're gonna figure out what our drift is right now. Once we establish that, we're gonna be just running it to the top of it, killing the engine, and then drifting down. This 32 regulator will drift slow enough that two anglers will fish on whichever side we're drifting down on, and we'll just go ahead and jig. Let's do um, like that nuclear chicken combo for uh, for you. These are uh, new Z-Man Door Matadors, designed for fluke fishing. We've put them through the test this spring, and they've been awesome sea bass teasers. They uh, hold up really great. They stretch. You can get a lot more bang for your bait. They're soaked in a procured gel. You have the scent element. You have the durability. And you have the action the recipe for success when you're looking for a competent teaser in this grub style bait. So here's the rule of thumb. The guy that's usually in charge of the tackle, if he gives you a color, probably not the one you want. You want to go with the color of the guy who's actually putting it on his rod. So we're going to check the different colors it's, it's here. Early, you switch it up. <laughs> you, you got to cover your bases, see what ones the fish like, and then uh, you can always adjust from there. You're just going to see what mood they're in. So Chris, that's your setup. That's all set. See if that holds bottom for you. Oh, here they come, right here, Cheech. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and try this really quick. So all you wanna do here, guys, is hit the bottom, which I just did. You can see the slack of my line. I'm just gonna pull it off the bottom, slightly off the bottom, and every once in a while, I'm just gonna tease it. With these grub style baits, you don't want to jig too aggressively because the tails have so much action. Sometimes the hook points will, uh, We'll go back through the uh, bait. And that's basically uh, a six ounce Spro bucktail. We have a backwater baits poison tail teaser. Mix the colors up a little bit and see what they like. So right around 25 feet, we've got some great marks. I wanted to break the ice, but I didn't. Gave you every opportunity every in the world. Every opportunity. He rigged me up. He was a complete gentleman. There we go. That didn't take long. Teacher's nope. tight. Keeper, Cheech? Decent male, yeah, definitely a keeper. Nice. Big blue knot on his head. So these sea bass, I mean, not only are they gorgeous, but when they have that electric blue on them, that tells you that they're actively spawning. Beautiful, beautiful male sea bass right there. This one's gonna go back, and uh, we'll see if we can. what I tell you about the color? Keep in mind, I, I selected the white and pink for myself. Nobody in the last six days has caught anything on these atomic chickens.
This sea bass fishery is literally one of the best sea bass fisheries on the planet here uh, in the Cape Cod area. There's, there's three stocks basically of black sea bass. One runs from Cape Cod to Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. The other one is Cape Hatteras, North Carolina to the tip of Florida. And then there's that Gulf of Mexico stock that is from the tip of Florida all the way out to Texas. So they have a pretty big range and we're blessed here in Buzzards Bay to have one of the best fisheries going because this is really where they come to spawn from mid-May till about early July. When they're spawning, the males get super aggressive and they gather up a, a harem of females, they say. The females release eggs, they can let go uh, anywhere between 30,000 and half a million eggs, depending on the size of, of the female. And the males basically let the milk go and in just a couple days, those sea bass eggs floating in the water column become larvae. They grow pretty fast, the smaller ones. Uh, end up moving into the estuaries and back bays and start their journey as, a, as an adolescent sea bass until they start growing to sexual maturity, which is about, I think, two to three years before they can reproduce. Which brings up a great point. What will happen with these sea bass if there's, if there's not enough males? Here it is. If there's not enough males, one of the things that they'll do is they'll actually switch over. Females become males. This is a little, little fella. There's a little female right here. This right here is a female. The males will have a big hump that come in here. And that's just a little They're female. They're protogenous hermaphrodites. Uh, scientists aren't really sure why they do this or what triggers it. Uh, like Chris has said, a lot of times it has to do with uh, the amount of females that are in a spawning group. If they're of size, they can switch to a male and continue the rest of their life as a male and they basically develop a big hump on their head, the they're male colorations. Own, what they're doing is they're ensuring their own productivity. If there's too many females, they'll literally, a female will turn into a male. Pretty cool fish. They're uh, part of the grouper family, and uh, they're just a ball on this light tackle. Oh, there we go. There we go. So guys, one thing that's cool about this fishery is if you want to get young kids involved, this is a great fishery. And the reason that's why- a big female is that you can bend the rods on a regular base out here and the kids will meet with success. So Anthony's already had his almost four-year-old daughter Adele out here and his son Anthony who's two and a half. And what's great about it is they're going to bend the rod. You know, with kids you want to keep them engaged as much as possible. Like we were talking about, this Buzzards Bay fishery is just a fantastic fishery because the biomass of fish are spawning here. The state record actually was caught here in Buzzards Bay in 2007 and it was um, eight pounds, 15 ounces, That's which, which is a state record. That is an absolute monster. So we're fishing a tandem rig right now, and the good thing is, is trying to mix up the colors. I have an atomic chicken on the upper rig right there. I have that on there. I have, I think, pink and white down below. Cheech has got orange and pink orange and white. Orange and pink and white. So if one of these colors ends up being a little bit more consistent, we'll go ahead and switch over. Ooh, I just got whacked and missed him. Nicer fish? Um, yeah, they're getting a little better. That one's decent. Not so much a net fish, but. What color was he on? Nice quality. He's on the white and pink, so it looks like I got two or three on the orange and a couple on the white and pink. And you can lip these guys. They do have some teeth on the bottom. If you go past them and you get under the tongue there, it's all soft and smooth, but they do tear your hands up pretty good, so. Just got one tear there, Cheech. I'm gonna see what color he's on. If you've got salesman, salesman's hands, Counting money all your life. <laughs> you might want to wear some gloves because these do do a number on your hands. So you can see guys right here. Here's the difference between a female and a male. Female, nothing up top here. No lump, no different color. As Cheech said, you can see the color in here based on them starting to spawn or in a spawn. You got the big knot head. What I try to do, even if it's a big female, let it go. That's yep. the spawning stock right there. Get them back in the water. And that's probably one that could go back because yeah. we've been catching these fish bigger than that. It's clear that the sea bass already have their fandom in southern New England. From the opening day of the season in late May 
to the middle of June, you'll find a big fleet drifting through the better known areas of Buzzards Bay. If you were to hop from boat to boat, you'd find anglers of all ages and experience levels using tackle that ranges from the lightweight freshwater gear I'm rocking to telephone pole stiff boat conventionals and everything in between. You'll find million dollar boats with several outboards hung off the transom to tin skiffs and kayaks and everybody's catching. Sea bass are truly a fish of the people. Cheech, the gear over the years has changed so much. This is the equivalent of what we used to fish with back in the days in freshwater. And now, this is what we're using out here in the salt. This is a six foot six Terramar. The power stroke is, is medium heavy, and the action on the very tip is gonna be medium fast. I've got the Tranks reel on it, fishing Power Pro, 20 pound braid, and this is a perfect setup. Give you a nice bend, but you can fish this all day long with one hand. Shimano makes a, just a, an absolutely great product. Did you got your St. Croix go-to, right? Yeah, a, a combo I do a lot with. Um, and I like to bottom fish with spinning, with spinning out fish now. Oh, that one came off. He's, he may be going in the box with, with a, or concussion protocol. He's one or the other. I think he can go back. He bumped his head. I feel bad. We'll send him home. There he is. He came in and wanted, he was, you know, one of the things that we say out here is every knock gets answered. Yeah, the light gear is really fun with these guys. A lot of times I'll use my freshwater like Mojo Bass that I, I bought for throwing jigs for largemouth. Gee, just one might be a first box fish. Yeah, that's a nice one. That's definitely the fish of the day. Cheech, I think this guy's going in the box. Yeah, when you bleed these fish, the fillets, the blood just comes right out of their lateral line. Um, it, it makes the fillet really, really clean white fillet. So what I like to do is just take my finger, if I'm gonna keep a fish, pop it into the gills and pull. Uh, you pull a couple gills out, you put it in uh, salt water and ice slurry. When you go to cut your fish, the fillets are perfectly white. With this regulator, huge live one on the back, going, I'm gonna fill that up, put on the aerator. No sense of getting everything bloody this early on. As early morning turns to midday, anglers shed layers, some more than others. But the thing that remains consistent is bent rods and a laid back vibe. Cheech, they're all over the place down there. I'm gonna change over to something different. Here he is. Oh, yeah. And I was in free spool, but I set him with my thumb. <laughs> Nice female, want to get that fish right back in the water. That's, that's one for the box. Yeah, that one can go. Perfect, he ate the white with red and yellow. Sometimes I like to, you know, mix it up. These things love lobsters, so if you can find those dark, deep red colors, they can work. So what I'm gonna do is try one of these band of anglage jigs that moves in the water because it has wings on it, which is very different from those. That'll sit on the bottom as well, that will too, but if you look at the wings on that, it's gonna give it a little action as it goes down. So I'm gonna go ahead and change that out. A little longer profile on this hook, so I'm gonna measure that. And the other thing, it's got a nice clasp on there. See that? That's gonna help me to anchor that. So what I'm gonna do is measure it out to about there. This is gonna go on a little further. Spin it out. I'm gonna slide that over that and now that's in line i'm back in the game when this drops it'll drop a little bit differently just had two good whacks come on there he is so what I like to do is find the bottom, come right off of the bottom, and that's where there's, there's sit. It's a nice one, Chris. Quality fish, nothing wrong with that one. This guy's good. That one can go in. So what I, I change up the color, you can see it right there, the band of anglers. 
just beautiful, almost like a squid pattern there on the very top. Here we go. Cheat that one, Elite. Yep. So if you did skip to the end here to see how we cook up these tasty sea biscuits, you'd have missed all the fun that sea bass fishing provides. As we head for the barn, I realized that for me, fishing for black sea bass has become much more than a grocery run for fillets. It's how I introduce my children to fishing. It's how I kick off my saltwater season on my own boat. And it's how I reconnect with fishing buddies I haven't been on the water with in months. I might not remember each sea bass outing in the same detail I do a trip for bluefin tuna, but I've come to appreciate those trips just as much. It'd be so easy to continue to write off sea bass as nothing more than a fill the freezer fish you can catch two at a time with heavy conventional tackle. But in doing so, you'll overlook all that has made them one of my favorite species. That's good. So we had an incredible day on the sea bass grounds out in Buzzards Bay. We successfully put the sea biscuits in the basket and now we're here with Andy Nebreski, columnist for On the Water of Living Off the Land and Sea, and he's going to chef up an amazing meal. That's right, and uh, yeah, I used to rattle my ego eating another man's fish, but now I've kind of grown <laughs> to like it. So you don't have to get to bed early and you don't have to fillet them. So yeah, today I'm gonna to be making a traditional Portuguese dish called sablada. Um, I heard, first heard about this from Odd in the Water contributing writer Charlie Soares. Charlie grew up in New Bedford, which is an area rich in Portuguese heritage. Uh, and he was telling me a story about this dish that he used to eat as a kid. He said, you could smell it three blocks away, and it was called sablada. And he said they used to make it with mackerel. And I got to thinking, if this can make mackerel taste good, you know, I bet it'd be really good with something like sea bass. So I didn't know how to spell it, so I called Charlie back. I'm like, Charlie, I need to figure out what this recipe is. And about a week later, he got back to me with the correct spelling, uh, which is C-O-B, <laughs> the correct spelling. <laughs> C-E-B-O-L-A-D-A. -A. Um, I was trying to spell it with an S, so nothing came up. And I found the recipe. There's not a lot of recipes for it out there. And this is kind of my take on a traditional Portuguese classic dish. All right, I'm going to start off with a couple tablespoons of olive oil. Turn that up, let that get nice and hot. Once our oil is hot, we are going to add in some fresh bay leaves. Let those kind of simmer for a minute or two. Now we're going to add about three cups of chopped white onion. And the onions are kind of really the star of this dish. They're going to really cook these down. They're going to add a little bit of sweetness to it. We're going to want to get these until they're brown. We're going to saute these for about seven or eight minutes. Hit these guys with a little bit of salt and pepper. Our onions have been sauteing for about eight minutes now. You can see they're getting translucent. They're also just starting to get a little bit browned on the edge. And that's exactly what we want. We're gonna add in three cloves of minced garlic. We're gonna add about a half of a small can of tomato paste. Give that a good stir. We're gonna cook this for about another two or three minutes just until the garlic starts to soften. Now we're going to do about a quarter cup of red wine to deglaze the pan. Now we're going to do a good spoonful. This is Portuguese crushed red pepper sauce. It's got a lot of heat to it, so about a spoonful. We can always add more later if needed. We're going to do about a tablespoon of red wine vinegar. We're going to add one 14 ounce can of diced tomatoes. Now we're going to do about a half a tablespoon of smoked paprika. Turn this all the way to low and we're going to want to let this simmer for about 15 minutes or so. And we're going to add in some diced chorizo. This is a hot Portuguese sausage. And you don't need a lot of that in there, but it's really going to give it a, a nice flavor. Give that a little stir and we'll let this go about another 10 minutes or so. 
All right, our sauce has been simmering down for about a half an hour now. It's ready to go. We're just gonna add in one pat of butter and that's really gonna help richen that up. Throw that in there, turn the heat off, cover it. Now we're just gonna do a little dusting of salt and pepper on these lovely black sea bass fillets. I like to serve this in these individual ceramic bacon dishes. We're just gonna spoon a little bit of that lovely sauce in the bottom. So now we're gonna take our sea bass fillets. We're just gonna tuck the thin tail section underneath and that's gonna make it nice and even in thickness. So it cooks evenly. Put those on top of the betta sauce. Now we'll just put a little bit more of that sablata sauce right on top. Don't want to cover them all the way, still want to have some fish showing through a little bit like that. Now we're going to fire these guys into a preheated 375 degree oven. You just want to make sure that the rack is up towards the top of the oven. And we're going to let those guys ride for about 10 minutes. Normally I'd garnish this with parsley. I don't have any parsley, so I do have some beautiful fresh basil and sage. So we're going to go ahead and dice that up. All right, so these have been baking for about 10 minutes. They're looking like the fish is definitely done. We're just gonna finish these under the broiler. And we'll broil them for about two to three minutes just to get a little bit of color and a little bit of char on top. All right, those are looking beautiful. Just getting a little bit of char on the tomatoes on top. You can see the fish is starting to flake, which means it's done. We'll just give these a little drizzle of olive oil on top. A little garnish of fresh basil. And there you have it, black sea bass cebolata. Now, make sure you get some of all the little goodies on there. There's something there wrong with your cebolata, <laughs> Aplangata. <laughs> That's good. That's it is good. It's good. relatively light, pretty lean dish, good summertime meal. And the onions really add a lot of flavor and sweeten it up, which I really like about it. Definitely going back for another another helping. Mmm. It's good stuff. Really good stuff, man. That's delicious. Keep an eye out for that recipe in the Living Off the Land and Sea column. Andy Nebreski on the water. Cheech on the water, signing off. It's time to chow down. Thanks for the sea bass. No problem. Appreciate it.